Can you hear me? Oh, it's good. Uh, <coughs> okay, so I would like to start by thanking the organizers. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to, to be here today and deliver this talk. Um, it's been a wonderful meeting so far, and uh, I've truly enjoyed it, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the week. So you can see the title there. Um, before starting the, the final details, um, I have recently moved into, into a new university, but when you look at the, the universities, I'm, I'm moved, traveled uh, 15 kilometers or so, so it's basically I'm still within the uncertainty of my previous institution. Um, I'm currently um, uh, having a four, broadly speaking, four different research themes, um, and the most latest one is the, is the new experiment that I'm constructing at Swinburne but you will need to wait for another day to hear the details of that. Instead, today um, I will be talking about some of the results um, that I've been involved in in studying the 2D quantum turbulence problem. So I want to thank my friends and colleagues um, listed here who, who are featured in this, in this talk today. Um, the plan of the talk, um, after introduction into some of the ideas um, in this topic, I go through a little bit of theory, and then I will describe some experiments. And uh, uh, given the way the time is traveling, we might need to skip the more theory part, but we'll see when we, when we get to that part. OK, so, so to set the, set the scene for this, uh, this, this talk, um, what we are interested in is broadly speaking the, the scenario of emergent structures in 2D flows. So the, here's your classical picture of the universe energy cascade. And you've got some uh, scale invariant flow, and then at the end of it, you have got these emergent large scale structures, and we would like to understand these things. So, so the great red spot of Jupiter, that's the, you know, the thing from the past. Here's the, the great array of, of red spots on the polar region of the Jupiter, and, and uh, it is fascinating to look at these pictures and wonder um, what causes them. So one idea um, in, this, in this context is, is, is Beatty Onsager uh, that we know very well, uh, which basically is based on this seemingly extremely simple model where you've got the logarithmic uh, function called H, um, and then you've got the equations of motion for these, these point particles. Uh, and it was Onsager's insight that, that this model uh, predicts these sort of uh, large-scale coherent vortex structures that correspond to absolute negative temperatures. So that's one of the, the key insights from this, uh, this work here. And the, and the crucial thing here really is, uh, that I would like to emphasize, is the fact that there's the logarithm. So, so the logarithm in the sort of energy functional, if you like, uh, means that everything is critical in, the, in this 2D world. So, so the entropy scale has log of distances. Energy is, energy is now uh, proportional to the logarithm. So that means that there's lots of interesting uh, uh, comp competing um, terms in appearing in, the, in these systems. OK. Um, so cutting the long story short, um, so Onsager predicted these uh, large-scale structures forming in these vortex systems at negative temperatures 70 years ago. Finally, uh, 70 years later, we have got finally experimental, direct ex experimental evidence for, for the existence of these, these structures described in these two uh, papers that were published last week. Um, negative temperatures were actually first uh, realized experimentally only one year after Onsager's original work and, and more recently also in the, in the cold atom systems in optical lattices. But these two experiments here are the first ones to, to realize these, these uh, negative temperature states in the original context as predicted by Onsager. So, so two groups. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the Tyler Neely's experiment. Uh, Matt Davis is going to give a talk on Friday, and I assume that he's going to tell you more details of those. Uh, I will tell you a little bit of details on the 
on the Monash experiments conducted at, at Chris Helmson's laboratories, uh, mainly run by uh, his student, jo uh, Sean Johnston, who has just recently graduated and, and awarded a PhD degree. Um, however, before going into the details of the experiments, um, uh, let's do some theoretical background on, on this problem. Um, so here's a typical um, experimental image of a cold atom Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and this is, this is typically what you see. And there's some, some you know, uh, obvious features in it that you can, you can very well recognize. And it might be a silly thing to, to pose to this community here. But I would like to pose a question here. What is a quantized vortex? And where is it? So it may, may sound like a, like a silly question to ask, but, uh, but I actually want to dwell on this a little bit further. So experimentally, there's the, there's the additional issue of, of you know, the, those dark spots in the, in the region of the, of the fluid. You can see they are vortices. Uh, um, the addition, so you can see them experimentally very easily, but then the question is whether they are plus or minus sign vortices. Uh, that problem has also been resolved very recently, and that is one of the key uh, developments that have enabled these experimental observations of these negative temperature states. Um, but so let's uh, let's look at this this system. There are the vortices. Okay, so these are the, the dark spots in the in the in the fluid. But these spots, these points, or smeared out points, they are not part of the fluid. They do not belong to the fluid. So I remove them. There they are. So these are, the, these are the particles that we are interested in. And what is left is just the gray matter. It's, I mean, it looks a bit like a brain. Uh, so I call it gray matter. Um, and when I've removed the particles, I've got only the gray matter left, which is the fluid. And so I'll also put that aside. So there it is. So what is going on here is on the right-hand side, You've got this multiply connected region of fluid of atoms. Okay? On the left hand side, we've got these point like looking smeared out particles, these vortices, and these are our particles. So the picture here is on the right hand side, that's your electromagnetic field. The singularities in the electromagnetic field, but that's just the field. On this side, you've got the particles, and these particles are your electrons, they are the sources of that field. So you can have two di different descriptions for the same thing. So you describe the, the gray matter with your gross pitevsky equation, for example. That's your fluid equation. And then you describe your particles using the Gonzaga's point vortex model. These are your particles. So you've got this, this duality here uh, between the uh, fluid and the particles. And the point here now is that these particles live in 1D world, whereas the fluid lives in 2D world. So as you can see, the Onsager's point vortex model, the that's the phase space of these particles. The phase space is two-dimensional. That means that the particles are one-dimensional. The atoms that live in the fluid, they've got mass, they've got momenta, and two coordinates, x and y. So the phase space is four-dimensional. So the fluid atoms live in 2D world, and the boundary theory is your vortex particles that live on the boundary of this fluid. So here is the boundary, another boundary, and that's where the vortex particles live. So the, so the particles generate, they are the sources of the field, and when they move, they will need to push the, the field around, away from them, and vice versa. If you're looking only at the field or the fluid, there's these particles that are obstacles and, and, and the fluid needs to flow through the particles. So absolutely. So you can, you can get one from the other. So you can either follow what is the field doing and then finding out the singularities which are not part of the fluid and that's where the particles are. Or you can just follow the particles and you can infer where the fluid has to be and what is the velocity field of the fluid if you know where the particles are because they are the sources of the... Sorry, sorry. 
through my <laughs> there's no particle on the right there are atoms yeah, yeah. yeah through the atoms okay yeah, uh, so 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 they they, they are just the, the you can view it as the as your g p equation the fluid uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this just you know picture. So that's the real experiment there. Um, let's get to that later. There will be plenty of that happening. It, de it depends what what your particle is, and that's why I asked in the start of the this, what is the vortex. So here they are represented like, like black dots <laughs> of some made up things. But if you actually do a proper theory, these particles actually are quantized, well-defined quantized particles. They've got wave functions that describe them. And I can also already, <laughs> since you asked what these particles are, they are just your Bogolgov quasi-particles called Kelvins. We'll get to that later. So since these particles are particles, uh, they obey Heisenberg uncertainty relation, and the way you can understand where this comes about is the fluid, these locations, uh, these singular locations where there's no fluid, there's a harmonic oscillator potential, the, the um, condensate wave function, the, the density of the fluid is a harmonic parabolic potential where the quasi-particles live. So there's bound states in there, and the ground state uh, of the potential is what do we call a Kelvin, and the Kelvin has a frequency omega, and so so that's where you get the the, the inertia for these these particles. And if you look at the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, you can see that the the phase space area, the minimum phase space area for these particles is just the h bar, which is just the area of the vortex core. And then you can obtain the mass for the for these particles, which only depends on the, the particle fluid, so, sorry, the condensate density, and then inversely proportional to the Kelvin frequency of, of these these Bogolyubov modes. Okay, so so that's that's something to keep in mind later on when we, we start looking at the experimental results as well. I need to give you a little bit of uh, this is a little bit of a jump but this is a crucial part to understand the following results. Um, so there's a very uh, nice way of classifying vortices. If, you could, if you've got this selection of vortex particles here, so blue and green correspond to vortices and anti-vortices, you give any configuration, there's a unique way of assigning vortex vortices into dipole pairs. Here's one, that's a dipole, here's a green cluster, there's a blue cluster, and then the remaining ones are free vortices. So th this is a unique association. So if any configuration, there's a unique way of assigning which, wh where are th these clusters, where are dipoles, and where which vortices are free. That's all you need to know about it. Th two and nine are not a dipole because if you ask number two, who is your nearest neighbor? It's number one. If you ask one who is your nearest neighbor, it's two. They agree that they are dipole. It's a mutual uh, nearest neighbors. Yep. So, so details can be found in, in those two papers. Okay. So now that we've got this, uh, these preliminaries out of the way, now we can play. Okay. It's always fun to play. Here's a game. We are going to play a game uh, called Monte Carlo sampling. So. So there's the H function up there, and what we are interested in doing is we are interested in finding uh, the most likely configuration of these particles. So there's, okay, two signs, again, blue and green. On this side, again, two signs, blue and, and purple, uh, but both are otherwise equivalent uh, scenarios. And the temperature parameter T in both cases are at the moment, it initially, it's corresponds to essentially an infinite temperature as far as the vortex configurations go. And then what we are going to do here, we're going to play the game, and we are uh, ramping the temperature on this side. We ramp the temperature parameter to zero, 
on this side, we ramp the temperature parameter to negative zero, and then we just, you know, watch. So we're watching what is happening to these, these particles and antiparticles in this scenario. And we see initially everything is very high entropy state. Um, we expect to see some sort of low entropy state occurring at the, at the lowest of temperatures, and indeed that is what you see. There's no dynamics. This is Monte Carlo sampling. This is temperature, yep. So uh, in real time now, temperature is changing. So, so that, yes. So what do, you, what do you see here? Okay, so this is just your costless Taulis transition that you observed there. This is the low temperature phase where you still have got particles because our particles have got a uh, rigid core, so they cannot be removed from the system. They just get bound in these dipoles. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, you see that the final state is, is a Wigner crystal of particles, well, actually two of them, and, and this is the extremely, this is the highest energy state in the system, this is the lowest energy state in the system. Mm -hmm. Correct. In, in these cases, they were, it, the only thing that is conserved here is the particle number, uh, the, the vortex particle number. So there's 50, I think there's 50 blue ones and 50 green ones, and there's 50 blue ones and 50 pink ones. Absolutely, you can put anything you want. Okay, so that was a fun game, but you know, when you keep playing the game long enough, it gets a bit boring, and you might want to play another game. So we'll get to the other game very so shortly, but before playing another game, uh, we want to actually look at the results of our, our game. You know, it's fun to gather statistics when, when you're playing games. So here's some statistics. So what you see here is on horizontal axis is, is temperature. So the temperature parameter actually is the inverse temperature. So zero on this axis corresponds to infinite temperature. There's a blue region, which is low temperatures, positive temperatures, red region, which is negative temperatures. On the vertical axis, we are now counting at any given temperature. We keep sampling the configurations and we do the classification of the vortices into clusters, dipoles, and free vortices, and then we plot them how many of the vortices belong to dipoles, clusters, and vortices at, at given temperature. So what do you see here on the positive temperature? You, you start lowering the temperature, number of dipoles increases, and ultimately all you've got left in the system is dipoles. And there's a phase transition, which is very well known, uh, where the, the trend, all, the, all the vortices pair up in this, these dipoles. On the negative temperature side, what you see is that the Clusters win, ultimately, all you've got left in the system is clusters, as you saw in the, in the Monte Carlo game. Um, the final state is just everything is in these two clusters, and that's the end of the story. Um, it stands for Einstein-Bose condensation. Sorry? BKT, Berezinski, Kostelis, and Thales. Uh, this is, yes, so, Red curve counts vortices in the system. There's 100 vortices. How many of them are in dipoles? Green tells you how many of the 100 vortices are in free vortices. And the blue curve tells you how many of the vortices are in clusters. And then when you add up all the vortices, you always need to get 100 vortices. So this is just the normalized the total number of, you know, you divide those numbers by 100. So this, you can view at either the probability of finding dipoles at this temperature, or you can simply say that, well, it's just the number of, uh, multiply that number by the number of, total number of vortices in the system, and you know how many vortices are belonging in the dipoles, for instance. It was the cluster finding algorithm that I just described earlier. It's the identification. There's, there's the unique way of assigning those, those as I described earlier. We'll get to that later, yes. Um, okay, so, so the... Yes, correct. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, yeah. That, 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 there's boundary conditions. So, so, so the, it, it's exact solution. So, so the so the Hamilton Hamiltonian has got image vortices that give you the e yes. There's one image per vortex, precisely. Okay. So. Okay. If we have time, in the third part of the talk, I'll tell you what that is. But as you can see, I can tell you what it does. It, it's zero at the critical point, and then it grows uh, when you go at the low and lower, well, um, low and lower entropies in, in the system. So, but the key point here is that, that if you look at this, this blue curve that tells you the clustered fraction, it's a monotonic function. Likewise, the red curve is a monotonic function, so which means that if you do now an experiment and you just see these vortices, if you can identify the signs of circulation, then all you need to do is to identify the fractions of the, to do the same thing as, as you did in the Monte Carlo calculation, identify the clusters and dipoles and ask how many of the vortices belong to clusters. And then you go here and, oh, it's many, okay, well, the temperature of this vortex gas is that. So you can use it to find what is the temperature parameter in the system. So that's vortex thermometry, as we call it. It's, it's the cost of the critical temperature. Just, uh, no, I didn't define it. It's the, it's the standard, well, yep. Okay, again, I can, tell I can tell you that, okay, so, so these, these calculations are for charges that are conserved. So usually when you think about the cost of the you think about the XY model where the charges can pop up and go away and, and so on. Uh, you can get exactly the cost of the value in this model, but if you do that, you need to make a dynamical core size. So, There's a lot of things you can do here. This is just to show that you get the right physics. We are not interested in this because this there's deca decades of, you know, okay. There's all, all, you know, there's no point of doing any work on this one. You know, it's an old story. So, so at the infinite temperature, everything is roughly speaking completely dismayed out. It's the high entropy, so there's everything is equal. So it's that's the infinite temperature region, so that roughly speaking, there's uh, broadly saying same numbers of all, all, all sorts of things. It maximizes the entropy. Okay, so as I said, when you play with these point vortices, it's fun and it's rewarding, but then you get bored, so you want to do a different game. So here's another game that we can play. It's the Grosbytevsky equation, and again, we've got blue and green particles. These particles are, have opposite charge, and then we've got the electromagnetic field here, and what you're seeing here is uh, um, quantum electrodynamics of these particles. So you can see lots of lots of pair annihilations, uh, occasional pair creation process, and lots of radiation. Uh, and that's not surprising, um, but what is surprising is what happens to this system when you wait long enough. So the intuitive picture here at least to me, it was intuitive picture before I did these calculations, uh, would be that all of these, just, you know, there's equal numbers of blue and green uh, particles, they should just disappear and annihilate and vanish. And then we get some uh, condensate at some elevated temperature. But surprisingly, you see that there's this persistence of this green cluster and the blue cluster, they tend to hang out and they just don't disappear. They just hang out there. So that is, um, Yes. Yes. Which yes. It energy is conserved. Uh, angular momentum is conserved. It's in a, in a circle. All, all the all the conserved quantities are good. Uh, the number of vortices is not conserved because there's no conservation rule for that. 
the, uh, if, you, if you look at them, you can see how they start. You start initially, there's no sound. The vortices start annihilating, they produce a lot of sound, and you can see how the sound waves are gener being generated, and at the end, you see very, very smooth, tiny, high-frequency high ripples. Yes, we, we expect that the sound waves do thermalize. They, they thermalize to their own, you know, phonon temperature, and the vortices here thermalize to the vortex temperature. So that's the, that's the picture. Th they do couple, but they couple weakly, and that's the crucial point. So there's a weak coupling, but it's sufficiently weak that you've got separation of time scale. So, okay, so when you play this game, it's kind of you know fun then to if you're a global observer like all of you are, so you're looking at this thing from the distance and you can't help but wonder what is going on here. Which way is the time going? You start from here and arrive there. If I only look at the particles, our particles are now the vortices. Clearly, they tend to go in the more ordered structures, and that's kind of unusual. Uh, the other point is that. Let's say that you're this, let's say you're this green particle here, and then you look around yourself, and you might ask, where are all the antiparticles? Can't see any. Funny universe it is, isn't it? Okay, so with those preliminaries, let me now move on uh, to describe the, the Monash experiments uh, and to see uh, is there something that we could do with this these systems experimentally. You know, so far we've, we've been just playing games, but it would be nice to do something real. So in order to do something real, you need to go in the lab. Okay, so here's the, here's the experimental setup. As I mentioned, this is Chris Helmerson's group. Uh, Sean Johnston has been doing all the hard work here, uh, uh, building and, and tuning all, all of the things so that they work nicely. Uh, simplistically, Here's the trapping of these cold atom gases. You create a BC uh, trapped in this central region. Everything that's green is a laser light, and you're creating a trap there where you're trapping the atoms. Uh, and then the top uh, beam comes from the DMD light, so you can create this cylindrical ice hockey puck uh, trap where the atoms are trapped in this dark region uh, in figure A. And you can also use that light to, to control creating arbitrary potentials, time-dependent potentials. And in this case, what they do is to use this, these white blobs, the grids on the, on the top row. They are repulsive potentials that you move through the, the condensate uh, as time goes to the right. And that generates grid, like grid turbulence into this, this BC. Then you take an image of the fluid. And here's an image of the fluid that you typically see. And you can see these vortex particles in there, uh, and that's how you generate the, the quantum turbulence in the system. And now we come to the, the, the key point here. If we want to do the thermometry and, and figure out what is the vortex temperature here, we need to know, is this an anti-vortex or a vortex? And the same for each and every one of these. So, th so there's at least a couple of ways of doing it. One is uh, one idea that we were playing around for some time was uh, it's called the vortex gyroscope imaging technique where you could actually tilt these vortices to make them precess, a bit like NMR scenario, make this, these vortices precess in opposite directions depending on whether they are vortices or anti-vortices. But uh, during that process, uh, Yong-Yil Shin's group uh, devised this uh, velocity selective drag scattering technique that enables you to identify the the vortex sign uniquely in this, in this problem. Just to give you the, the, the minimal information out of this is what do you do is you knock out two components of this BC. You take a class of atoms that move in this way and the class of atoms that move that way. So the blue and the green blobs, it's like your Doppler shifted cloud of atoms moving away from you and moving towards you. And then when you combine these, these two images into a single image, you subtract them, you'll get plots like this where blue regions 
are the regions where, where the atoms that came out of the cloud are moving away from you, and the red regions are the, the regions where the atoms are coming towards you. Why is this useful? Well, it's useful because you know that the velocity around a vortex is a circular symmetric, so no matter in which direction you take these images, where there's a vortex, there's always on one side the fluid flows away from you, and on the other side it moves towards you, which means that when you look at where the vortex is, there should always be uh, blue on one side and red on, on the other side. And that's indeed the case. So here's uh, three images that shows you only the density. You see where the vortices are. Now that you know where the vortices are, you can construct this uh, velocity map, and then you mark everywhere where you can see a vortex here, you mark it on this map, and you see these crosses tell you where the vortices are, and then you just basically look at, okay, here's a vortex, there's red on this side, blue on that side, you know the sign of it, and so on. But to do it more, more um, rigor, I mean, you can actually see this just by eye, you can find out which ones are vortices, which are anti-vortices, but there's a very, very neat thing that you can do. You can do a trial and error of every possible configuration. You place a vortex here, and then whatever the rest are, then you try, maybe it was an anti-vortex, so you try every possible configuration of this, whatever, 20 vortices or so, and then you reconstruct the point vortex velocity field. Those are the sources. They generate the velocity field. You can, you can plot that, what it is, and these are the kind of uh, maps that you get, and then you compare pixel by pixel all of those possible configurations uh, with the experimental data, and there's a very, very nice, unique solution. There's one and only Con, you know, sel selection of signs that really gives an ideal match with the experiments. And that's how you can tell which ones are vortices, which are anti-vortices, and once you know that, everything, you basically have reconstructed the whole incompressible velocity field within approximations, because you know the locations of the charges, the particles, and, the, and you can reconstruct the velocity field, and then you can apply the clustering uh, cluster finding algorithm, you find which vortices belong to clusters, which belong to dipoles and free vortices, and that enables you to extract explicitly what is the temperature of this vortex gas. So, admittedly, these are small numbers of vortices, so it might be very difficult to see any difference between A, B, and C here at the, at the outset, but when you go and look at these quantitatively, in a statistical sense, for example, the J here, shows you there's one, two, three, four dipole pairs and only one cluster, the one green cluster. So that should be very close to the, the positive zero temperature cost of the kind of state. Here on the other hand, you've got one, two, three, four clusters and only one dipole. So this is very, very clustered state, so this should be a negative temperature state. And indeed, when you do this um, and you plot all of these configurations, Here's, again, the temperature, and here's the, the probability of finding the, these different regions. This is the experimental data, and the underlying solid curves are not any kind of fits into the data. They are coming from the game that we were playing earlier. So uh, th there's fluctuations around that. They, they, they are not exactly the same numbers, of course. But, but you see how you generate the turbulence, you assume that you're generating equal numbers in a statistical sense, but there's always fluctuations. Uh, the vortex temperature. The vortex temperature is measured here. On x-axis, the temperature is there. You just read it off from here, from the mapping to the Monte Carlo data. So, so for any realization, there's a blue dot, green dot, and red dot, and they have to sum up to one, always. So, so you've got this triad, and then you see the, the solid curves are the, the Monte Carlo theory, and then you go and find, do my three points fit? They fit here. Okay, this is the only configuration where they fit. And then you read off what is the temperature. You, you, you make everything is measured directly from the experiment, and then you compare with the point vortex Monte Carlo calculations, that, that where the temperature is input parameter. 
No. No. So the, so the solid line is, is these lines here. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's look at the last one here. Here you've got an experimental observation that the green and the red dot have got the same value and the blue dot is up there and have got some other value. Now I can e easily imagine, I mean, the total number has to be conserved, so I can move the blue dot out of that curve, a little bit down somewhere here, and these will need to adjust a little bit, and you su suddenly find that th there are configurations that you could have red dot here and green dot here and a blue dot somewhere there, but there is no experimental observation like that. No, 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 no. The temperature in the experiment is whatever it is. You measure the locations of the vortices and you map it onto the thermometer. You always, you know, you stick something into the system and you calibrate it. Yes. Yes. There's a there's a triad that you. Okay, I should have added the. So look at the paper. There's a. This is explained in the in the paper how you, how. It. Yep. Okay. So. It's very simple actually. It's tr it's almost trivial. <laughs> okay, so. In the Monte Carlo. No, no, you you can start any anywhere and, and then you go into. The so 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 you can start any anywhere and you, you just need to run it long enough. I mean, of course, if you start from some some configuration. There is an initial time. The, the, the in the Monte Carlo numerics, there is no hysteresis because you just put in a temperature and you find what is the most conf probable configuration at that temperature. So you can start from anywhere and you always get the same. So Well, th there's, uh, you know, there's uncertainties in the, th there's statistical uncertainties, so everything fits in there. That's all good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's exactly the point. So in the, in the experiments, there's time evolution, so the, the system samples the, in, princip in principle you've got enough time to sample enough the, the possible, and the vortices, if you saw the, the movie earlier where the vortices are moving everywhere, annihilating, that is your thermalization process, to, so the, the vortices find the most uh, likely configuration in dynamics. Yes. Yes. You, you, there's lots of, for, for each data point, there's lots of experiments. You take, take statistical averages. So, okay. So, there's no, no, so, so what is conserved quantity is the angular momentum of the fluid, the atoms. So that's got that, that, that's not that's got nothing to do with the angular momentum of the fluid. So the point, yeah. So, sorry, is the, the no 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 because the number of number of vortices is not conserved. Yes. 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 The an the annihilation. Yeah. yeah. So, so you can you can 
you can have annihilation at the boundary, but they are rare. So you, you can have a have a at the boundary of the. Yeah, I, I, no. yeah, yeah, but it depends where, where you where, where you're counting boundaries. So in an experiment, this is a this is a fluid. So you've got image vortices outside of the boundary. So you can have drifting of vortex and annihilation at the boundary, and you never counted the image vortex in the first place. So you can have change of the total number of of charges. So it's a, it's a soft boundary. I mean, it's a, it's a steep trap, but it's a, in in a sense it, the wave function extends to infinity. There's yes, no, that doesn't mean anything because I can I can move the vortices in arbitrary locations, and change the angular momentum by by drawing the vortices closer and so on. Yeah. Okay. So let me describe now two sets of of experimental data in this experiment. So the high entropy case and the low entropy case. So these are the highly negative temperature states. These are very close to infinite temperature. And I just want to draw you, uh, uh, your attention to a couple of details. Let's, let's start from looking at this graph here, F. So what you're seeing here is now that we've got a reconstructed full velocity field, so you can do whatever you want with that data. So one thing that you might want to do is to plot the incompressible kinetic energy spectrum, and that's how it looks like. And then if you look at the inset, that's your compensated spectrum. So as a function of time, so the, remember these are all separate experiments, but as a function of time, what do you see? Um, the, the spectrum evolves from the yellow to the dark, dark black, so you can see that there is a piling up of energy at the largest scale in the system. So this is what you see. This is what we call evaporative heating-driven inverse energy cascade in the system. So there's some evidence that this process is taking place. Okay. On the low entropy side, I mean the, the way this this works is these vortex pair annihilations remove energy at the short scales, and the remaining energy is flowing into the uh, you're reducing the total number of particles and therefore the energy per particle goes up. So that's one way of understanding it. On the other, other side, where you are at these extremely high energy states, where you expect, expect most of the vortices to be in clusters, imagine the extreme case, you've got only one cluster of plus sign and one cluster of minus sign. There's no longer annihilation ha happening. So you cannot anymore heat up the system by vortex annihilations because the annihilations cease. They don't exist anymore. So then what starts happening is that these clusters start expanding via dissipa dissipative coupling to the phonon bath. And therefore, what you see is a reduction of energy at the larger scale because the clusters just spread out. And that is consistent with that picture. Uh, then you can look at the quantitative measure measurables. In this case, the energy increases as a function of time. Here it decreases, just as the, the spectra show you. You can look at the inverse temperature. You can see how there's a uh, change of the temperature close to infinite temperature, and it, it goes towards negative temperatures, strongly negative temperatures, which is consistent what you see when you're looking at the clusters. The fr fraction of clusters increases over time, and everything matches. You can look at the dipole moments and, and uh, correlation functions, nearest neighbor correlation functions as well. On this side, everything remains in clusters very st stably, and associated with that, you see that the system is at very, very negative temperature and, and stays there for very long times. Uh, so that spectral peak that you see there is, as, as predicted, it asso it's associated with these large-scale structures of these vortices. So there's a pil piling up of, of energy at the largest system scale because of these large clusters. This is, this is from the second game that we played. So, so no, this, this is the Grospitevsky game. So at the final state, when you saw this clustering of these blue and green, char green charges, uh, you get this uh, piling up of, of energy on the, on the system scale from that. As you can see, that the, there's borders in a big cluster and, and another cluster. Yes. 
Uh, <laughs> definitely. Experimentally, absolutely. <laughs> there's sm small deviation. In, in the numerics, there's, <laughs> there's small deviations. Yes, I, I don't know, you know. I don't know whether, you know, the times, the experiments don't run long enough so that, the, you know, the, there could be runaway dissipation at the edge of the universe. In, uh, there's, there's, you know, the, even the particle atom number is changing slightly over the, you know, these are five seconds. So over that five second time, you, you lose atoms through three body collisions and so on. So. Uh, I, I don't. It's it's not. Let, let's put it the way. It's not significant in terms of, of of the of the dynamics of the vortices. So so, um, I believe it's not cooled during the during this sequence. But I I cannot. I, I don't want to make any statements on that um, because I I can't remember whether they were also applying cooling during the revolution or not. Okay. Um, okay, so here we are. More theory. I've got only one third of my talk left. So, um, but I'm, I'm sure that people are far more interested in, in having a lunch than having a, uh, another extended discussion on, on vortex particles. But I just, if I can have one more, one more minute, I'll just give you an idea of what I would have uh, told you otherwise. So the point here is that the top row shows the, what, what we've done in the experiments, looking at these neutral uh, vortex systems where the clustering occurs because you go into these high energy states. You can do the same thing with single charge, only basically a rotating system, and there's also a condensation. This is the Einstein-Bose condensation transition that occurs in both cases. So what this transition corresponds to, it's not the separation of green and blue vortices. What it is all about is these vortices clumping and forming a condensate. In order to understand what that means, you need to understand what those vortex particles are. And I'm going to skip here and just tell you what the vortex particles really are. So remember the, f the fluid and the particles. Here's a numerical calculation where in a harmonic trap, you can see a, there's an axisymmetric vortex 1D problem. This is the particle. One of these particles, that's the vortex that occupies the core of the vortex. There's the fluid. So that's your fluid. That's your vortex particle. And these are quantum mechanical objects. You can, you can find the Bogolubov modes, and they are quantized. And there's the excitation mode that corresponds to this is the eigenenergy, this is the particle. Particle physicists like to think about these excitations as particles, and that's our particle. It's got a mode density that is shown there, and that's what they are. If you have many vortices for each and every vortex in the fluid, there is a corresponding particle in the Bogolubov excitation spectrum. And so, for instance, if they are spread up like this, there's lots of, lots of vortex particles spread around in the system, whereas if you calculate a case where they are basically a, in a one singularity, if there's only one singularity here, but you know that the circulation, total circulation is very large, you will find only one particle. But this is a macroscopically populated particle. It's a Einstein-Bose condensate of the vortex particles. So that's the, that's the physical picture, what's going on there. And since I have run out of time. I'm not going to tell you about the uh, uh, non-symmetry breaking aspects of this transition, and I'm just going to finish up here. Thank you. <laughs>